Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books, out loud. This is a little blue book. It just happens to be Little Blue Book, number 1708, and it is titled, The Political Philosophy, Philosophy of Socialism, written by Morris Hillquit, and it was written in 1931. Now, this is, uh, I believe, part three, or four, I'm not sure. This is the next part. And we start off on page, top of page 23 with the next chapter, and it is Indictment of Capitalism. Capitalism. The system of private ownership of the modern sources and instrumentalities of wealth production has thus lost all economic and ethical justification. It has outlived its usefulness, and its continuance causes most of the social and economic evils of our time. It creates the striking, almost savage contrast between the rich and the poor. The modern millionaire and multi-millionaire, in comparison with whom the wealth and power of the mythological Midas and Croesus pale in utter insignificance, and the middle western miner of southern textile worker who leads a primitive life of misery and privation, it confines all advantages and benefits of modern civilization to the limited classes of the wealthy or well-to-do, and excludes the large masses of the working population for the comforts and pleasure of modern life and the joys of culture and art. It causes antagonism between the capitalist classes who own the necessary tools of labor and the working classes who operate them for hire an antagonism sometimes open, violent, and sangry in the form of embittered strikes or lockouts, sometimes silent, sullen, and suppressed. It forments conflicts between producer and consumer, between seller and buyer, and between landlord and tenant. It breeds rivalry among manufacturers and traders bitter competitive rivalry, and when the rival capitalist interests clash in the markets of the world, they sometimes explode into sangry armed warfare. The criminal world war, so fresh in the memory of the present generation, which has taken the ghastly toll of ten millions of young human lives and all but destroyed modern civilization, was a war of capitalist competition for world markets. This has since been admitted by the most enthusiastic and authoritative supporters, not any particular nation or group of nations, but the competitive capitalist system of the world must be changed with the crushing burden of war guilt. Capitalism, in its decaying stages, not only fails to secure the peace and security of nations, but is rapidly ceasing to function for the maintenance and preservation of its own economic system. The economic system of competitive manufacture and trade involves a criminal waste of productive forces and unnecessary duplications of plants, roads, and efforts in rearing a large army of unproductive middlemen who stand between the producer and the consumer in costly advertising campaigns and in many other operations incidental to the competitive st strategy. Above all, however, the system is doomed to recurring breakdowns in the form of cyc cyclical trade depressions or industrial crises. These are peculiar in the economic system of capitalism. Since 1825, the first recorded date of a general industrial breakdown, the world has been visited by no less than 13 of such crises in 1825, 1836, 1847, 1857, 1866, 1873, 1882, 1890, 1900, 1907, 1913, 1920, and 1929. In each instance, the depression was worldwide and lasted from less than a year to about two years. The periods of prosperity between attacks of depression and constantly narrowing and are constantly narrowing, and every successive depression is apt to be more acute than its predecessor. The cyclical depressions, while they last, while they last, paralyze the whole body of industry. Production is suddenly curtailed or stopped. Commerce is halted and workers are laid off by millions. 
The whole absurdity of the capitalist system comes to light in the paradoxical situation where workers are compelled to go without food, clothing, and other necessities of life because they have produced too much of them. They have produced too much of them. Where the granaries, warehouses, factories, and stores are choked with goods they can, that they cannot sell, while millions of people who want them cannot buy them, and where armies of workers ready able and eager to produce the things they need for their subsistence, or refused access to the factories, while are kept closed, which are kept closed, and the necessary machines which are kept idle. Industrial crises are inherent in the capitalist system, and are inseparable from it. In an unregulated competitive system of private industrial co enterprises, every condition is bound to produce as much as it can hope to dispose of in an active market regardless of the course of its rivals. After a time, manufactured commodities thus accumulate in excess of the demand. A condition of technical overproduction is created. On the other hand, the workers as a whole do not get enough wages to enable them to repurchase an adequate part of the things they produce. If they did there... If they did, there would be no workless income for the capitalists. This leads to a condition of chronic underconsumption. Overproduction and underconsumption consumption are the two sides of the same metal. They signify a condition in which there is a large accumulation of goods, larger accumulation of goods than people can afford to buy. When production is dramatically curtailed and the accumulated surplus of commodities is generally absorbed, Industrial stagnation is followed by a period of renewed activity or prosperity, which in turn inevitably culminates in another breakdown or depression. There is no escape from the vicious cycle so long as the capitalist system of production endures. Next chapter, the socialist program. And I need a sip because I'm cotton mouth. Socialism. Socialism aims at a radical change of the basis of the modern industrial system. It would socialize the main resources and tools of wealth production, transportation, and distribution, such as metal and mineral mines, oil and gas wells, water power, railroads, pipelines, telegraphs, telephones, warehouses, factories, mills, and other essential instrumentalities for the maintenance of human life in modern civilization. It would take the basic and vital industries out of the field of private, competitive, and speculative operation and reorganize them as social functions and institutions to be managed by public agencies for the benefit of the people as a whole and not for a priv privileged class of property owners. The socialist scheme of industrial organization contemplates a system of scientifically planned production with due regard to the needs of the people and with the elimination of waste and duplica duplication of effort inherent in the present order and an adequate distribution of the product. This program does not imply a centralized nationwide organization for the management of all industries. It would leave the various organs of political government, national, state, and local, to take charge of such industries as, comes, as come most properly within their respective sphere and scope according to the character of each particular industry. It, it could permit certain industries to be managed by voluntary associations of producers and consumers, such as cooperative groups under proper restrictions and safeguards. It does not propose any interference with the purely individual efforts in the sphere of the arts, crafts, or scientific pursuits, nor is socialism opposed to the individual ownership of articles of personal consumption, comfort, pleasure, even luxury. Its whole concern is that the modern social instruments upon which the community must rely for its food, clothes, shelter, and other necessities and comforts of life should not be monopolized by one section of the population to the ex exclusion of all others, so as to leave the great masses of the people in a condition of economic helplessness and dependence. As political equality was the watchword of the young bourgeoisie and its struggle against the privileged feudal classes, so is industrial equality the slogan and objective of the advanced ranks of the modern wage workers in their struggle against the economic oppression of capitalism.
itch. Drink. Next chapter. The Socialist Philosophy. The philosophy of individualism, which reflected the economic needs and political aspirations of the nascent manufacturing and trading classes, found its first halting and timid formation at the time when feudal society entered upon the stage of economic dissolution, and the new industrial order was in the throes of painful childbirth. It became more articulate and de definite as the feudal system became more antiquated and oppressive, and the rising class of bourgeoisie grew stronger and bolder. It developed into the complete system of social philosophy supporting a definite political program when the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. In the same manner, the socialist program and the social philosophy on which it is based evolved gradually in a measure as the capitalist system of production developed, matured, and reached, its lim reached the limits of its usefulness. Revealed, in short, revealed its shortcomings and sowed the germs of a new industrial order. In the first hesitating suggestions of a social order based on collective ownership of productive wealth and cooperative labor occur in the works of philosophers of extraordinary keen social perception, writing towards the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, such as Thomas Spence in England and Gracchus Balfalf, Balbalf in France. These ideas became more distinct and elaborate in the works of the group of writers of the early part of the last century, generally known as utopian socialists, such as St. Simon, Saint, Saint Simon Furrier, and Pondhu in France, Owen in England, and Whiteling in Germany. The, fall, the full formation of the modern philosophy of socialism may be said to date from the publication of the Communist Manifesto in 1848. The authors of the work were two German scholars, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the fathers of modern socialism. The manifesto in its doc is a document of only a score of printed pages, but it contains a complete outline of the historical, economic, and political basis of modern socialism, which has sub subsequently been expanded into a voluminous library of elaborate works. The youthful authors of the historic manifesto took socialism out of the vague domain of ethical precepts, metaphysical speculation, and emotional appeal, and planted it on the solid ground of economics and working class interest, thereby converting it from a school of philosophy into an organized political movement. Henceforward, socialism sought its realization and fulfillment not in indiscriminate moral preachings addressed to all classes and to the whole world, nor in experimental and artificial model communities, but in the organization of the workers of all industrial countries with the definite aim of gaining political power, securing control of the machinery of government, and using it for the plant transformation of the capitalist industrial order into one of socialism. It was on the general basis of that philosophy and program that the contemporary political movement of socialism with its commanding organizations, power and influence in all advanced countries of Europe was built up. The Communist Manifesto has been translated into all important languages of the modern world and has been printed and reprinted to millions of copies. And yet, it was neither the Communist Manifesto nor any of the later works of Karl Marx or other socialist the the theoticians that made the socialist movement or will determine its success or failure. A clear, convincing, and eloquent formation of principles may be very helpful in considering, stimulating, and propelling an, ec an economic process and political development. It cannot create them out of, the, out of the void. Its absence can retard but cannot frustrate their courses. The Great French Revolution would have occurred, though perhaps not at the same time and in the same manner, without the works of the philosophers of individualism, and the socialist movement would probably exist, though possibly in less definite and universal form, if Marx had not lived. It is a far cry from 1802 when a bill for the regulation of the labor of apprenticed children introduced in the British Parliament, Parliament by Sir Robert Peel was declared as an unwarranted interference with the individual liberty 
of employers and workers. To the elaborate system of factory legislation, now in force in all advanced countries, which limits the hours of work of women and children, pardon me, provides safeguards in the operation of machinery, sanitary standards in factories and stores, fixes compensation for industrial injuries, and in some cases even establishes a minimum wage. In almost all civilized countries, the government recognizes the social duties of the organized community towards its workers by providing for their support from pupils from public funds in old age, individual in, in validity. Sickness and unemployment. Even the government of the United States, the most individualistic and capitalistic of all, is beginning to, capulate to the, capitulate to the principle of social responsibility in these fields. Workers' compensation has been introduced in all industrial states. A number of states have adopted some ru rudimentary systems of old age pensions and projects for public support of unemployed workers and before Congress and the legislature of several other states. Our government, which was established on the district principle of non-interference with business, has gradually and imperceptibly assumed even larger economic functions. Today, it supervises and regulates the whole powerful network of the vital public service business. It fixes the charges for the use of railroads, telegraphs, telephones, electric current, gas, and water supply. It passes upon securities which, plastic ser which public service corporations may issue and prescribe their mode of operation and quality of service. It, has, it lays down the condition which, upon which the business of banking and insurance may be conducted and keeps it under contract and watchful surveillance. Through an elaborate system of licenses and permits, it regulates and restricts a large category of enterprises and imposes tests and conditions on the exercise of trades and professionals. The activities of the numerous economic bureau and the departments of the interior commence commerce and labor. The Interstate Commerce Commission by the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Trade Commission, the Farm Board, the Water Power Command Commission, and the Radio Commission constitute the major part of the practical functions of our federal government. They are all concerned with business management and are supplemented by public service commissions and, sim and similar regulatory bodies in the state governments. While the theoreticians and apologists of capitalism are busy demonstrating the impracticality of socialism, capitalist governments are daily surrendering to the irre irresistible force of its principles and policies. And that brings us to the end of book number 1708, The Political Philosophy of Socialism, written by Morris Hillquit. Copyright 1931. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next book.